Hi there. In this video, we're going to keep going with chapter three. And we're going to look at confidence intervals. So let's get started. What proportion of college students find solitude distressing? What is the difference between adults and teenagers in terms of their response to fear? Researchers often ask questions like these about populations. Because researchers don't usually have direct access to the populations, they need to analyze data taken from representative samples. Data from these samples will provide information about the populations of interest. So these first two questions here, uh, these are the questions we're going to look at in the first two examples uh, in the slideshow. These are both um, sort of experimental psychology examples. And these are the types of things that researchers investigate in the real world. Um, for our purposes in the class, we want to connect the ideas of section 3.1 with the new ideas that we're going to learn in this section a little bit later. So these are two good examples uh, to, uh, to see how to break problems down and sort of, you know, put things in little boxes. And then after we've sort of organized the problem and analyzed it, then we actually attempt to solve it. Because the solution techniques are different depending on the situation. And you have to figure out the situation. So what, one way to figure out the situation is use this chart. This is similar to the chart that I put in the section 3.1 notes. It's not exactly the same. Um, this, is the, th this chart is what we're going to use for the whole rest of the class. So we will not introduce any more parameters. We will not introduce any more sample statistics. Um, and we will not add to anything on this list. So this is it in terms of um, what we're interested in learning about. So let's do the first example, and I'll show you how to use this chart. Um, so when you're doing the homework, you want to print this chart out or whatever, or print out all the notes, and just keep this handy. You're going to use it on the homework. So let's talk about college students and solitude. In a 2014 study of the psychological effects of solitude, 146 college students were asked to hand over their cell phones and sit alone thinking for about 10 minutes. Afterwards, 76 of the participants rated the experience as unpleasant. So we have two parts to the problem here, and this is similar to what we did in section 3.1. Uh, using correct notation, define the population parameter being estimated. And for part B, compute the best estimate for the population parameter and write it using correct notation. So as you can see, for both of these, we, we need to, to, to use proper notation. Uh, there was a little bit of that on the first exam and in the previous section. Starting in this section for the rest of the class, notation becomes incredibly important. Um, okay, so let's do part A here. So what is the population parameter? So what we saw in section 3.1 was that a parameter is a number that describes some aspect of the population. Here, we don't know what the population is, so we have to figure it out. We have to analyze the problem before we even start the problem, right? Before we solve anything, there's nothing to solve at this stage. Later on, by the end of chapter three, we will know how to solve a problem like this. Right now, we're still just breaking it down. All right, so what is the population? Well we can see that there is a sample, right? 146 college students is our sample. That means if that is a representative sample, the population has to be all college students. So we're looking for a number that describes some aspect of the population of all college students. Now we have to look at how many variables are there and are these variables categorical or quantitative? It doesn't say to do that in these problems, but you have to do that, okay? Um, so we have 146 college students, that's our sample. Then we have 76 participants rated the experience as unpleasant. So what this tells us is that the researchers, after uh, the participants were sitting by themselves for 10 minutes, they filled out a questionnaire and one of the questions had something to do with how do you rate this experience? Unpleasant, pleasant, maybe some other options. 
Well, the fact that they were choosing from a list of options means this is a categorical variable. So that means we have one categorical variable and the population is all college students. So go back to the chart. Here's our variables. We have one categorical variable. That means we're interested in a proportion and the population parameter, so the number that describes the population is P. So the answer to part one is going to be P. It's the proportion of all college students who find solitude unpleasant. So we talked about this a little bit in 3.1 and you have to keep this in mind. We don't know the numerical value of P, nobody does, but we still need to give it a name and a description. So P exists, it is a number. There is some proportion of college students in the United States that don't like sitting by themselves with no cell phone. We just don't know what that percentage is. So the idea is that we're trying to learn about that percentage, this unknown percentage or proportion. The sample gives us information about that proportion. And that's what part B is telling us, right? Compute the best estimate for the population parameter. So we want to know what proportion of all college students uh, find solitude unpleasant. Researchers take a sample and find that 76 of the 146 uh, find this situation unpleasant. And that, looking at the chart, becomes our sample statistic p hat. So there's that's part A, that's P. That's what the researchers are interested in. Researchers collect data from a sample, compute the sample statistic, which is p hat. So this is the best estimate. As we mentioned in the previous video, that is a technical term. Best estimate is a technical term or point estimate or just the word estimate as a noun is a technical term in math. And it means exactly this. It means parameters are unknown, statistics are known, every parameter has a single statistic from a sample that best describes that corresponding parameter in the population. All right, let's do another one. In the 2015 study, participants first learned to associate fear with a particular sound. In the second part of the study, participants heard the sound without the fear-causing stimulus, and their ability to unlearn the connection was measured. A physiological measure of fear was used with larger numbers indicating less fear. The sample mean response for adults was 0.225, and for teenagers it was 0.059. So parts A and B here are the same as the previous example. We have to break this down and figure out what is the population or populations, there might be multiple. Um, and then for the best estimate, we have to compute it, or maybe it's given to us and we have to label it, right? All right, so we're gonna do the same thing we did in the previous problem. We're gonna start with the population or populations. So all it says is that we have some participants, that doesn't tell us much, but the so the participants those are people right so the cases for the study are people and it looks here like some of them were adults and some of them were teenagers that tells us that we have two populations right all adults and all teenagers so this sample if it's representative or values of the variable explanatory variable are randomly assigned in which case they wouldn't be you can't assign people to be adults or teenagers um but it, let's say that this is a representative sample then this, gr this group of adults represents, you know, the population of all adults. This group of teenagers represents the population of all teenagers. So that tells us that there are two populations, but how do we know what the parameter is? So let's go back to the chart and see if the chart can help us. Well, from what we saw in chapter two, if we have one categorical variable, one quantitative variable or two quantitative variables. Those are always from a data set that has a single set of subjects or participants or cases, right? Whatever word you want to use for that. The ones that we saw that there were differences when we had multiple cases or sets of cases, right? In which case you'd have two categorical variables or maybe one categorical and one quantitative. So just remember, anytime you have 
um, two groups, whether it's randomly assigned like a, you know, experimental uh, vaccine versus placebo or adults and teenagers, that means that the categorical variable is the explanatory variable. Whenever that happens, it's always something minus something for your parameter. And likewise, for your statistic, it's something minus something. So all we have to do is figure out, is our response variable in example two quantitative or categorical? So let's check that out. Well, we're told here in the problem that we have a mean response, right? So think about, you know, what's, what's implied by that. A mean comes from a, a quantitative variable. So that means that this problem has a categorical explanatory variable, quantitative response variable. That means the population parameter is mu1 minus mu2. Check on the chart. You'll see that's what it is. And what we do is when we have two groups like this and we have to subtract one, uh, one mean from another, we try to label them so that we remember which one's which. So mu1 minus mu2 becomes mu a minus mu t for a for adults, t for teenagers, right? So the difference in the mean fear response between adults and teenagers, this is a population parameter. We're talking about all adults and all teenagers here. So this is what researchers are trying to learn about from the sample. All right, now what is the corresponding sample statistic to this population parameter? You look at the chart, uh, the corresponding sample statistic for mu1 minus mu2 is x bar 1 minus x bar 2. In this case, we're just going to call it x bar a minus x bar t. Um, plug the numbers in, compute the difference. So again, this is quantitative. Um, the units don't matter. We weren't given the units in this problem. I didn't want to go too in the weeds on this. Um, but again, this is just, it's some amount of physiological response um, uh, to fear. So, so this number gives us a good estimate or gives the researchers a good estimate of the actual difference in the population, right? So the best estimate for the parameter is the relevant sample statistic, x bar a minus x bar t. So the first two examples are similar in a lot of ways, but different in lots of ways, right? They're, they're both sort of psychological experiments. Um, well, the first one's an experiment. The second one is an observational study. Um, and, and they have different variables, right? First one was categorical, one variable. This is one quantitative, one categorical. But you can see that the, the way that we break the problems down is the same. You just, you figure out what the population parameter is, and then, uh, you find the corresponding sample statistic. Um, one note that has helped students in the past if it's easier for you to start with the sample statistic and then work backwards to the parameter, that's totally fine. I think it's more helpful to start with the variable and then work from left to right on the table. I've had different students have different levels of success trying different things. There's no best way to do it. Do whatever works for you. So uh, in examples one and two, uh, these samples were taken from volunteers with values of the explanatory variable assigned when applicable. If samples are randomly selected or the values of the explanatory variable randomly assigned, then we can use the samples to learn about the response variable values in the corresponding populations. But examples one and two only show results from one sample in each study. If researchers have the resources to repeat these studies many times with different samples, would you expect the statistics to be the same from every sample? So let me show you what I mean by this. Let's go back and look at the results from example one. So the sample that these researchers took, 76 out of 146 people, uh, college students said that they didn't like sitting by themselves with no cell phone. Let's say another team of researchers does the same experiment and samples a different group of 146 college students. Would you expect that other group to get exactly 76 participants rate the experience unpleasant, the same as this one? Probably not, right? We would expect 
a number close to 76 probably because this is a representative sample or in this case randomly assigned um, explanatory variable. So what we think is that if we were to take lots and lots of samples, we would get numbers close to 76 probably if this is a representative sample. And that would give us proportions close to 0.52. We don't know how close, right? So, you know, you wouldn't expect P hat to be zero. You, you would think some people don't like sitting by themselves without a phone. And you also don't expect it to be one or 100% because not everybody dislikes that. So we expect a number probably close to this number. And that's actually what I'm at. That's the question I'm asking here. So if researchers have the ability to take lots and lots of samples, then they can actually create a sampling distribution by just repeated sampling like we did in the previous section. And because all of these samples have different characteristics, their statistics will vary. To account for this sampling variability, we give a range of plausible values for the population parameter using this formula. The formula is sample statistic plus or minus the margin of error, where the margin of error is a number that reflects the precision of the sample statistic as an estimate for this parameter. So what margin of error means here is sort of the acceptable range of values that you would consider um, the, the population parameter to be close enough to the sample statistic, right? Um, and this takes a lot of getting used to. If you haven't seen this, uh, this concept used in the real world before, it takes some time to get used to it. The best example of a margin of error that most people have seen is during election results on TV when you're trying to figure out if one candidate is has a comfortable lead against another candidate and you're watching CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or CBS or whatever and it says uh, you know 52 percent are in favor of this candidate Smith plus or minus three percentage points margin of error that's where you usually see this concept. Well, we're going to use it to do the exact same thing. So it's called sampling error. And again, the word error here doesn't mean, so error in math has a special meaning that just means, um, it means like the acceptable range of values where something is still considered close enough. That's basically what it means. It doesn't mean that you're, that you're doing anything wrong, like you made a mistake. It's not error in in that sense. It, it, it's a very mathematical idea. So margin of error is one idea. And in the previous section, we saw something called the standard error, which is similar to a margin of error, but they are not the same. Margin of error tells us how precise our estimate is for the parameter. What is the acceptable range of values? So, using the data in example one, it can be shown that the margin of error for the study is plus or minus eight percentage points. Find the interval of believable values for the population parameter and interpret the interval in context. So, let's just do part A first. So, what we're told here is that using the sample in example one, so that was the 76 out of 146 students who didn't like sitting by themselves, the margin of error for the study is plus or minus eight percentage points. What that means is that that particular sample is considered accurate within plus or minus eight percentage points. Where that margin of error comes from, it's gonna take a little more time for us to really get to the bottom of that, uh, but next couple videos, we'll cover all that. For now, we're just gonna take it at face value. You're given the margin of error. So, what we do is we use the formula, sample statistic plus or minus margin of error. And we're told plus or minus eight percentage points. So, in example one, our p hat was 0.52 or 52%. So we just do plus and minus eight percent, or if you wanna write it as a proportion, that's fine too. So this means that between 44% and 60% is sort of the acceptable range of values for where we think the population parameter is. Because that sample, the 146 um, 
participants in the sample gives us a margin of error of 8%. Now we have to interpret this. So again, loosely we're saying uh, we're pretty sure that the parameter is in this interval, right? So let's, let's go back and make sure we understand this. Uh, look here. We give a range of plausible values for the population parameter. In example one, we established the population parameter was P. It was the proportion of all college students in the population who didn't like sitting by themselves, right? So when we interpret this, we have to write that back out and we have to mention that population. The parameter is a number that refers to the population. So the proportion of all college students, so that proportion we called P in example one, but you can, you can write it out in words like this. The proportion of all college students that find solitude unpleasant is between these two numbers, 44% and 60%. Now, obviously, this is not set in stone. Different studies would get different results, right? We talked about that. Somebody else might do the same study and get 55% here. Fine. According to that study, it would have a different range of values, but it would have the same margin of error. And so the idea is that there's some acceptable range of values where we think the parameter is. And that's all we're asked to do at this point, is take your sample statistic, add and subtract the margin of error, and then interpret the resulting interval. So this is just our best guess for where we think the uh, population parameter is, or it's where we feel confident that the population parameter is. But nobody knows where it is, right? Nobody knows what P is. It's not knowable because we don't have access to the population. For part B, so, oh, let me, let me go back. <laughs> Gotta do part B here first, right? Um, so using the data in example two, it can be shown the margin of error for this study is plus or minus 0.182. So same thing, find the interval of believable values for the population parameter and interpret the interval in context. So the population parameter for example two was mu A minus mu T so the difference in the mean fear response between adults and teenagers, right? That's what it said in example two. And that's going to be somewhere in this interval. So 0.166 is the difference. Add or subtract a margin of error. And we get a range of numbers. Those numbers tell us where we think the difference in the mean fear response is. So uh, the difference in the mean fear response between all adults and teenagers is somewhere in that interval. Now... This is computing um, these intervals. And later on, we're going to call we're going to give these intervals a special name. But the most important thing is interpreting these intervals, right? We think the parameter for this problem is in here. We think the parameter for this problem is in here. But nobody knows where it is because we don't have access to the population. So a couple questions. Uh, these are questions that came up. Um, earlier in the examples. So can we claim that the majority of college students find solitude unpleasant? Well, our sample statistic is 52%, and 52% is bigger than 50%. But because there's sampling variability, we're not confident enough because not every number in this interval is bigger than 50%. In order to confidently claim that the majority of college students uh, don't like sitting by themselves, all of these numbers would have to be bigger than 50%. So that's what we use these intervals for. We, learn, we use them to learn about the population. This number by itself doesn't tell us anything about the population. But this number and plus or minus this number does give us information about the population. And same thing here. So here, it looked like uh, the mean fear response for adults was bigger, right? So if you go back and look at, let's go back and look at example two, right? So, um, so the fear response for adults is bigger than the fear response for teenagers, right? Um, so according to this, it looks like adults have a larger fear response. But this is just a sample statistic. It doesn't tell us anything about the population. We need that margin of error. This margin of error is pretty large, 
So if there's a difference between all adults and teenagers, then all of these numbers would have to be positive or all of them would have to be negative. But we can see that there's negative numbers in the interval, which means teenagers have a larger fear response if it's negative. And there's positive numbers, which tell us adults have a larger fear response. So this tells us it's believable that adults have a bigger fear response and believable that teens have a bigger fear response. So if it's believable that both could be true, then we can't conclude anything. So that's what we use confidence intervals for, among other things. So just this is just something to keep in mind. Uh, margin of error, standard error, standard deviation of a sample are all different. You should already have all these in your notes, but you you got to keep going back over this because on a exam, I'll say use the margin of error given in the problem to solve this. And if you use the standard error, you're going to get the wrong answer. Or if you use the standard deviation, you're going to get the wrong answer. They're all related. Um, and by the time we get to chapter six, you will know exactly how all these are related. But for right now, they're all separate numbers that all do different things for us because we haven't learned the relationship between these yet. All right. So now we are in a position to define the confidence interval. So a confidence interval is an interval computed from sample data that will capture the true value of a population parameter for a specified proportion of all samples. And the proportion of all samples whose intervals contain the parameter is called the confidence level. So this is probably the largest intellectual leap that you will have to make in the entire course between section 3.1 to this part of section 3.2. And here's why. When we did sampling distributions, we took lots and lots of samples from a population. This confidence interval idea looks like it's saying the same thing, right? It's saying um, for a specified proportion of all samples. So if you went out and took lots of samples, some percent of those samples, when you build out the samples with a margin of error, you get that range. So if you took all the ranges from all the samples you took, a certain percent of them will actually capture the parameter. You 100% need to understand this idea. We will use it every day the rest of the semester. So the intervals that we saw in example three are called 95% confidence intervals. If we were to take many samples of the same size, about 95% of the samples would generate sample statistics whose confidence intervals contain the true value of the population parameter. For a single 95% confidence interval, we should feel 95% confidence that the interval has captured the parameter value. So the idea here, and let's go back and think about example one, right? So in example one, and remember ex example 3a was built on example one. Uh, we were talking about college students who don't like sitting by themselves. If you were able to go out and do that study 20 times and take the same size sample each time, then use that margin of error to build an interval around the sample statistic from all 20 of those samples. 95% of those samples should build intervals and those intervals should contain the parameter. So there's a lot going on here in terms of conceptual piggybacking. If you're not caught up, pause this video here, and you might have to go back and watch 3.1 all the way back through this again or reread re it. There's a lot going on. It is abstract. It gets easier from here, but we just made a large logical leap because it's, first of all, you don't know why it's true. So I'm going to try to show you why it's true. And second of all, it's a lot of new terminology that you might not be used to yet. Um, in example three in section 3.1, um, we saw that the dots in the graph represent sample means from 1,000 samples, each size n equals 100. So this was the NFL um, salaries example. And I made a dot plot of samples of size 100 from the population. 
Uh, so these samples come from a population where mu is $2.238 million, right? Again, it's not this number, right? We talked about that in the previous section. Sampling distributions are centered at the parameter. For the NFL contracts example, um, we knew the value, the mean value of the NFL contracts because that's public information. We just looked it up. Like that data is freely available. If we use sample means in the graph, so these are all sample means, right? Um, with margin of error 0 0.596, I went ahead and computed that for you. You don't, know, you don't need to know how to do that right now. About 95% of the intervals will contain mu. So think about this. If I went through every one of these dots and built out a little interval with margin of error 0.596, they'd all be the same size. About 95% of the intervals would contain 2.238. So what I did was I went ahead and just showed you what 20 of them look like. So I randomly selected 20 of those sample means built little intervals around them using the margin of error of 0.596. And one of them is colored red. And that means the interval does not contain mu equals 2.238. The other 19 green intervals do contain mu. And on average, about 95% of the intervals will contain mu. So each of the intervals is called a 95% confidence interval. So the way you do this, if you go back and follow the steps from example three and 3.1, I put in the notes and in the video how to build these sampling distributions. There's a little, um, there's a little icon up on the right that says confidence intervals. You can click on that and get this exact picture. I mean, don't do it for a thousand samples. You want to start with like groups of 10 or something. Um, so this is really just something that's built in, but we hadn't covered confidence intervals yet in that section when I went over it. So I'm putting that here. So what do we do with confidence intervals? Well, we saw in example three in this video, what we do, what we do with them. We use them to uh, give a range of values for what we feel the parameter uh, might be. So let's say that somebody went out and did this study 20 times. 19 of the sample means, if intervals are built around the sample mean would contain the true value of the parameter. Even if we don't know what it is here, we know what it is, but I'm saying, even if we don't know, it doesn't change the intervals, right? So there's really a 95% chance. If you take 20 samples that any particular sample will contain the interval or will contain the parameter. So those are good odds, right? And that's what we use confidence intervals for. When we take one sample, which is what's usually done in the real world, um, most people don't have the resources or most researchers don't have the resources to take lots and lots of samples. That the idea is we say, if that sample comes from, let's say you take a sample that looks like one of these, then we're 95% confident that the interval contains the parameter. If you're able to take 20 samples, then uh, that then it's a 95% probability. But most of the time, you don't get to take 20 samples. So here's how we compute a 95% confidence interval using the standard error from the graph. So we're actually going to uh, see something that we've seen before. So let me go back here. So we've already seen how to use this standard error when we did sampling distributions in the previous section. Remember, we build out a 95% rule. What we're going to do now, though, is scoot that 95% rule around, right? So we're going to, we're going to take the same width interval. I can't really superimpose it. Here, let me see if I can. Here you go. So let's say the interval is, where's my camera? Let's say the interval is this wide, right? That's hard. Everything's reversed. Let's say the interval is this wide. Well, we're just going to scoot that interval around. Or if the interval is this wide, we're just going to scoot that interval around. And 95% of those intervals will contain the parameter on average. And so we use the formula at the bottom, right? So all we're doing is taking the 95% rule that we had before in section 3.1. And we're saying that 
the margin of error doesn't change because the margin of error is based on the size of the sample. So we're, uh, the margin of error doesn't change. So we can tack that margin of error onto any of the sample means, and that'll give us um, the range of values where we think the parameter is. And it's centered at the sample statistic. Um, did I cover everything here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. All right, so let's go ahead and do the next example. So now we're just going to use this formula. Statistic. So it's basically sample statistic plus or minus two times the standard error. This is not the same formula from section 3.1. Section 3.1 told us if we know the population parameter, it tells us 95% of sample means or sample proportions will fall in an interval. This is not the same thing. Here we're saying take a sample statistic essentially at random and then build an interval with the width given by the standard error from the dot plot. That is your 95% confidence interval. All right, so information about several samples is given. Assuming the sampling distributions are bell-shaped, construct a 95% confidence interval for each and indicate the parameter being estimated. So all we're going to do here is use the 95% rule. We're just going to use this formula at the bottom. So notice that we're given sample statistics. So for the first one, it's 0.417 minus 2 times 0.154. So you type it in exactly the way it looks. Right? 0.417 minus 2 times 0.154. 0 0.417 plus 2 times 0.154. So that will be your confidence interval. And then we have to write the parameter. So what parameter goes with p hat 1 minus p hat 2? Big finger. It's p1 minus p2, right? So you can see that you don't have to know anything about the study. If you're given just the sample statistic, you know the parameter from that chart from earlier. If you know the population parameter, you know what to look for for a sample statistic. So it's all about finding values on that chart. And of course, when you have to compute them, your calculator won't do plus or minus. Just do them separate like I did on the calculator. Uh, let's see, next one. All right, so why don't you pause the video and try these other two on your own? So pause the video now. Okay. So if you did parts B and C correctly, you should have gotten both of these, right? They are just using the formulas. You would type them in exactly the same way. Give it a shot. Make sure you can get all these numbers. And also make sure that because the sample statistic in part B was X bar, that you write down its mu, and the sample statistic in part C was R, so the population parameter is rho. All right, uh, we're almost done. Last thing we have to do is talk about ways to interpret confidence intervals. So I already showed you two interpretations um, in example three, but we didn't really know what a confidence level was yet. We just kind of said we think the um, parameters in the interval. Now that we know a little bit more about what a confidence interval is, we have to use very precise language. So the confidence level indicates how sure we are that our interval contains the population parameter. For example, we interpret a 95% confidence interval by saying we are 95% sure that the interval contains the parameter. Or you can say 95% confident. It doesn't mean the same thing. So the way this works is that any value inside the interval is considered to be plausible or believable, and any value outside the interval is considered not plausible or not believable. So we get a range of values, and really, it's sort of a cut and dried thing. Um, anything inside or on the or on the boundary is believable. Anything on the outside, not really believable. Um, and this is this method works. It's a tried and true method, uh, and it works in a, in a wide variety of situations. So a ninety five percent confidence interval for a proportion is 0.72 to point seven nine. 
is the value given a plausible value of P? So again, your confidence interval would be P hat plus or minus margin of error. So is it believable that the population proportion is 0.85 if this is our confidence interval? No, it's not believable, right? Right, because it's outside the interval. And so on an exam, a question like this would not be a multiple choice. You're going to have to say how you know it's believable or not, and you have to use this language. Uh, what about part B? 0.75, is that believable? Yes, it is believable because it's inside the interval. That's all you have to do. Outside the interval, not believable. Inside the interval, believable. We're going to do this a bunch of times this semester. It never changes. Last one. 0 0.07. Well, that's outside the interval, so it's not believable. Oop. That's it. There's nothing else going on here. Okay. So we use confidence intervals to evaluate the believability of some unknown quantity, right? And this kind of thing happens all the time, right? So if your candidate is winning the election by 52% with a margin of error of plus or minus 3%, is it believable that the candidate could still lose the election? Sure, because 52% plus or minus 3% uh, that interval has 50% on the inside, so 50% is believable. And therefore, it's believable that the candidate could lose the election. Because remember, to win, you have to get more than 50%. I'm not talking about the Electoral College or anything like that. I'm just, I meant in, a, in, in just a, a normal general election, you know, for a state or a locality. All right. Um, interpreting confidence intervals in context. A random sample of 1,483 adults in the U.S. were asked whether they consider a car a necessity or a luxury. And we find that a 95% confidence interval for the proportion saying that it is a necessity is 0.83 to 0.89. So notice we're not given p hat here, right? We're just interpreting the interval. So the, the different ways to sort of break the problems down depends on what we're being asked to do. Explain the meaning of this confidence interval in the appropriate context. So I'm going to give you sort of the long answer and then in the notes it's the short answer. So the, the definition of a confidence interval is if we take lots and lots of samples, about 95% of those samples would have proportions that contain the parameter um, or have uh, intervals that contain the parameter. But when we're given a single confidence interval, we're saying that of all the samples that could be taken, we just have one. So this means um, that we're 95% sure that the proportion of everyone in the U.S., because it just says adults in the U.S., so all adults in the U.S. So we're 95% sure that all adults in the U.S., so the proportion of all adults in the U.S., who feel that a car is a necessity is between 83% and 89%, or 0 0.83 and 0 0.89. So there's options. You're allowed to say these things in different ways. As long as your sentence makes sense in English, and as long as you're, you need to mention the population, and you, you need to mention um, the confidence interval, and you need to say, it has to start with, we are 95% sure that, or we are 95% confident that. But you can switch the order of the rest of the sentence. It's up to you. And so whatever you feel is, uh, you know, easier to say or easier to uh, interpret when you're listening to somebody talk like this. So we're 95% sure that between 83% and 89% of all U.S. adults consider a car a necessity. That's fine. You could say that. Or we are 95% sure that the proportion of all U.S. adults who consider a car a necessity is between 0.83 and 0.89. There are many possible correct answers for this type of problem. In fact, while you're doing the homework, I recommend that you try to write out these in-context answers different ways so you can get the hang of it. It takes a lot of practice to get good at this, and even though we still have like three and a half months left, it's not really that much time, right?
So the generic interpretation of a 95% confidence interval is we are 95% sure that the interval contains the population parameter. And then we fill in any details given in the problem and paraphrase if necessary so the sentence makes sense in English. If this is a short answer question on a test and you write down nonsense, you're going to get zero points. It has to make sense. You have to mention the population. You have to mention that it's a proportion or percentage. And you have to talk about the confidence, how sure you are that the interval contains the proportion or that the proportion is in the interval. So um, the correct interpretation we just talked about, right? We're 95% confident that the interval contains the true value of the population parameter. Uh, it's easy for students to misinterpret confidence intervals because it refers to an unknown value. So let me show you some ways that students mess up confidence interval interpretation. In fact, I've seen textbooks, not your textbook, I've seen published textbooks used at universities make some of these mistakes. So each of the following interpretations for a confidence interval is incorrect. What is wrong with each statement? I'm going to go ahead and flip over to the answer key. Um, if you have these printed out, stay on this slide. All right. A 95% confidence interval contains 95% of the data in the population. So what's wrong with that? So what's wrong is that confidence intervals have nothing to do with data. Confidence intervals refer to population parameters, right? So the 95% rule that we saw in chapter two was talking about 95% of the data, but that is not a confidence interval. Confidence interval specifically refers to a population parameter. All right, second one. I am 95% sure that the sample statistic will fall within a confidence interval. Again, similar problem to what we just had. The confidence interval refers to the parameter. We use the sample statistic to build a confidence interval. In fact, the sample statistic is the center of the confidence interval. So you're 100% sure the sample statistic is in the interval because it's the center of the interval. But this should refer to a parameter, not a statistic. And last one, the probability that the population parameter is in this particular 95% confidence interval is 0.95. This is the trickiest one because in everyday life, we can use subjective probability to make this statement. But it's not mathematically correct to use subjective probability uh, when we're doing confidence intervals. So what ends up happening is that the population parameter is a fixed number. It doesn't change. So that's why we use confidence, not probability. So probability can only describe a random event. Well, parameters are not random. It's the samples from the population that are random. The parameter is a fixed number, at least, you know, at the moment that the study is done, it's a fixed number. I mean, parameters can change over time. Uh, so probability cannot refer to a fixed number unless you're looking at a sampling distribution where you have lots and lots of samples. But if you have a single confidence interval, you can't use probability in this context. All right. Well, that's it. I know it was another long video. Sorry about that, guys. It's just how this stuff goes. It's There's a lot going on in Chapter 3. So thanks for hanging in there. Uh, there's some extra practice, some great problems here in the book exercises. Make sure you try those out. Some of those are also in the homework. Um, so if you have any questions, let me know, and I'll see you next video. So bye-bye now.